welcome you to our latest podcast with Rick and Tiffany Bullman. Rick and Tiffany are sharing their story in their new book, Mended, One Couple's Journey from Betrayal to Imperfect Beauty. And in Mended, it really walks through the tragic experience that they went through, their testimony, ultimate betrayal, to a place where their marriage has been healed and restored. And I, what I love about this is their book's not just about the sad tale of a pastor's family crisis that ended well, but actually it's the practical ways any couple can grow together and remain emotionally connected. Mm -hmm. uh, and for us this morning, or wherever you might be at, uh, I know that you're not only going to be able to walk away with uh, some practical ways to experience your relationship and to really, at the end of the day, safeguard and affair proof your marriage. So, honey, thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, so I want to start out just maybe tell me about your guys' family. How did you two meet? How long you've been married? Tell me a little bit about your kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, in 1990, well, I grew up in Southern California. And so um, I was a desert rat. I lived in Victorville, California, and the high desert. And in about 1990, our, my pastor uh, stepped down from his position as senior pastor. And so we were in need of a pastor. Well, Tiffany's pastor in Washington State, because that's where she lived and grew up, mm -hmm. um, he was feeling a transition in his heart. And um, the Lord just led him to our, my church. And Tiffany was really good friends with the family, grew up with them and sang with their family and, and stuff like that. And she wanted to go to Life Bible College, which was in Southern Cal. And so she just kind of made the move with them. And I remember, um, you know, the, the new pastor comes and, and I like him and his family. And, and one Sunday morning, I just remember <laughs> seeing this beautiful angel that I had never met before. <laughs> on the platform with her sister and the pastor's daughter and they were singing this trio uh this the song and i just remember thinking who's that you know and so um i was sitting in the back row i was about 19 20 years old at the time and kind of you know wanted to meet her and made we made that happen and um uh and then we met and then probably about a year or so later we started dating mm -hmm. kind of circled back and she sinned and started dating some other guy when she should have been with me, but that's another issue. Oh, and then he got back together with his girlfriend. <laughs> and then... Yeah, there's more to that story. So anyway... Uh, that's we a, that's a separate other... book, right? What are we talking about men? That's okay. ended part two. <laughs> um, no, but we, we ended up uh, dating, and literally one week before our one-year anniversary of dating, we got married. So we got married in February of 1993, and Tiffany said, would you ever want to live in Washington State? And being in California my whole life, I'm like, sure, why not? So we moved to Washington and um, started making a family uh, immediately. And so then came Caleb, then Joshua, then Jared. And now we, you know, I'm Faith. And, and uh, Caleb's 24, Josh is 22, Jared's 20, and Faith is 17. Uh, Caleb and Josh, they're in Bible college. They want to be pastors. Uh, Jared is on a very fun journey of trying to figure out what he wants to do. Uh, and uh, Faith is a junior in high school. And we're here and we're here with you. So, yeah. Well, let, just start with the fact that you guys look way too young to have kids that are already in college. But you know, that aside, you know, I mean, it sounds like as you share all this, it's like the perfect family story. I mean, you have yeah. angelic wings that you're flying in on, Tiffany, to meet yeah. Rick. And, you know, everything was wonderful. But I know that there's more to this story in terms yeah. of the book Mended and, you know, your ultimate story of, of the affair, the journey of healing in your marriage. Tiffany, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about what happened with the affair? Yeah, um, you're right. Everything did look wonderful and beautiful. And we posted family pictures, you know, on Facebook. And um, <laughs> on, from the outside, everything did look great. Every, you know, we were the perfect family and, um, we were not happy. I was not happy. Um, and when, as when, when you say not happy, when did that start? I know. I, I, we was are that like right when you got married or was there a, when the kids started coming into the situation? Um, you know, 
we were happy and um there were good times but there was a lot of arguing and i feel like we did start arguing very very early on we did mm -hmm. we were we're two firstborns mm -hmm. we we both knew the right way to do everything i knew the right my way. way no my way <laughs> Rick was not properly taught how to empty the dishwasher. <laughs> I needed to teach him how to do that. Um, so I was unhappy for a very long time. And I really did um, feel trapped. Mm -hmm. It was just a hopeless situation. And what I should have done is get help, talk to somebody, go to counseling. Um, but I didn't. And I just felt like I just had all these cracks and crevices that weren't being filled. And so instead of getting help, I ended up um, having an affair with my best friend's husband. We got to drill in on this because I think there's a lot of questions. I know folks that are going to be watching this, listening to it. Right. You know, in the sense of like, it wasn't like you just woke up one day and you're like, hey, I think I want to yeah. have an affair with a friend. You know, um, there was a path that you walked down. And part of that was the pain that I'm hearing you describe that there was some, you know, places that were unmet. And I'm assuming that was that emotionally you felt like not met or was it physically? I mean, how, how did that show up in terms of leaving you vulnerable? Right. Um, I think that it was. I uh, you know, I'm a female, so it was mostly emotional cracks and crevices that I didn't feel taken care mm -hmm. of. I didn't feel um, like we were a priority. And little by little, because it was my best friend and, you know, and her husband, our families were together a lot. So he, he saw, mm -hmm. you know, where the empty spots were, where the cracks and crevices were, and he just started filling them and so i you know i i felt or i fell i don't know help me out here <laughs> well basically it, it, it's there's such an emotional need that i wasn't filling mm -hmm. and um when this gentleman saw that basically capitalized on, now he had multiple affairs going on so he's he very predatorial and so he would see things and um, start to scratch Tiffany where she emotionally itched. And she just, I mean, I mean, you can speak to this, just allowed that to um, fill your emotional tank because you were so empty, yeah. which then, you know, it was, it was a slow little process. It wasn't just, hey. It was very slow. Yeah. Yeah. Before you knew it, you're in this affair situation. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like, you guys were best friends as couples. So like mm -hmm. yeah. you both knew each other, you were comfortable getting together. And is that kind of, did that set the stage for this to really move from an emotional connection to a physical uh, affair? I felt like it did. And it did, uh, it did happen slow and I didn't have my guard up mm -hmm. and I, I didn't, I wasn't protecting my marriage. And I think that that's because it was so unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And so it started with little things like um, poking on Facebook. Do you remember back oh, in yeah. when Facebook well, first started, <laughs> you know, you could poke and, and you could, um, instant message and have little conversations. And so it started really slow like that. And then it just sort of snowballed. So Rick, I mean, in, in from your perspective, mm -hmm. uh, you were completely unaware of this yeah. happening. Like you yes. guys were getting together as couples, you're hanging mm -hmm. out together. We were on vacation. We I mean, you, yeah. you guys were on vacation, mountain. right? Yep. And you had no idea that this was happening behind closed doors. How did it come out? Like, I mean, what, what was it that ultimately, and I, I kind of want to press you guys for some details if that's okay. Yeah. Like, no, 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 how, no. Does, that, how did this take fine. place? Yeah. And all of this is, these are great questions because it's, we are very transparent in the book. So it's in there too. Yeah. So if people want to get it, they can really get it. But um, basically what happened, uh, December 26, 2013, 10 PM. <laughs> uh, never forget yeah. that. Um, there was a text message string that went back and forth between Tiffany and this gentleman. Mm -hmm. And I think he was at the gym and his wife 
went to grab the iPad that uh, for their kids to watch a movie or I don't know. I mean, it was late, but she was getting the iPad for something. And um, and his phone was linked to the iPad mm-hmm. and all the text messages. And so she sees that and calls Tiffany. Mm-hmm. And what happens, Noel, is that she calls Tiffany. Tiffany's literally like on the phone. I have my phone. It's just like going like this. And me and my son, Josh, who was 17 at the time, we're like looking at each other like, what's going on? So we lean in and Tiffany hangs up the phone and she's like, you know, so-and-so, her best friend, uh, who's portrayed as Lauren in the book, um, is accusing me of having an affair with Chad, her husband. And we're like, what? And we knew that they knew another Tiffany. Hmm. And so I'm sitting here thinking... Oh, please let it be this other yeah. Tiffany, you right, know, because right. sometimes in your contacts, you just have a name or an initial, not the whole name. And mm-hmm. so then my phone rings. So I'm like, hello. And Lauren is just your wife and my husband. And bam. I mean, it was all emotional, rightfully so. I mean, everybody was just losing it. And so I remember uh, telling uh, and, and, and my son's right there. So how do you have this and try to protect your child? Oh, at the same time? Yeah, Little three happened to be gone that evening, which I think was a good thing. Um, but uh, what happened was um, I told her, I said, take screenshots, send it to my phone and I'll wait because I want to see this. I didn't want to see it, but I needed to see it. Yeah. So uh, Tiffany was standing on the back porch and uh, I opened up the sliding glass door. I said, come here, please. And she came in and and I said, is this true? I said, cause I'm about, and I was holding up my phone. I'm about to get screenshots. So either you could tell me now, or you can say, let's see the screenshots. Cause I know it's not me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Tiffany just by the look in her eye, when you're married for 20 years, yeah. you, you can read them yeah. like a book. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I said, uh, is this true? And she just nodded. Yes. And I'm like, mm. and so then my mind starts, and I said, so this is emotional? And she said, yes. And I said, did you kiss him? She said, yes. And I'm like, okay, there's one follow-up question I need to ask. Because I want to know like how far this right. went. Sure. And um, I just said, did you sleep with him? And uh, she just said, yes. To which I said, what the hell were you thinking? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. I said a lot more lofty things yeah. as well. But mm-hmm. um, and that is when everything just went shh, just dark, complete mm-hmm. total dark. I mean, I was senior pastor. She's a worship leader. Um, this just didn't affect um, our family. Um, it's this is going to affect the church family, the extended family. It's going to have this massive ripple effect, mm-hmm. and it just got dark real fast Mm -hmm. and very hopeless feeling. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of how it all evolved. Fateful evening. And it's, and we, we unpack this. People might be going, wow, they shared a lot. (laughs) Read the book. Uh, But also the book though, let me just say, doesn't get into, it it gets into some of the courting details so people can see what happens so that they can go, wow, I need to watch out for that. Right. But we don't get into any of the unnecessary stuff. Yeah, well, and I so and I appreciate you guys sharing your story. I know that you know you guys um, have been willing to do that in a book, which is, um, I mean, it's gutsy, it's vulnerable. Um, uh, but I, but but Rick, if I could rewind the tapes for you, yeah, leading up to this, I mean, I know that Tiffany, you were like in a pretty bad place emotionally, just feeling you know vul- very vulnerable. But for you, Rick, what did this look like leading up to that? I mean, obviously, man, that moment. It was like a grenade went off in your guys' marriage, but leading up to it, what did that look like? Yeah, like the context of our marriage and just yeah. kind of the health of it and all that? Yeah. I always knew, let me say it this way. Our marriage wasn't good. It wasn't healthy, obviously. Mm-hmm. But I didn't think it was as bad as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Because when you're living in yuck and it, it, that becomes the norm, suddenly... You know, it's just 
you don't realize how bad it is when you've been living in it for so long type mm -hmm. of a thing. So for Tiffany and I, from the beginning, like she mentioned earlier, you know, um, we're two firstborns. So there was, and, and we butted heads and we're, we're strong personalities. Um, and um, there's, so there's always been this level of intensity. And when we had to have the last word, typically it was sarcasm. It was very sarcastic, but that sarcastic Sorry, I shouldn't say that, you know, those types of things. Um, it, it, that really led into verbal abuse toward each other, yeah. where then it became name calling and then it became commonplace. And it just didn't start out that way. It, it, it slowly <clears throat> got it, you know, from day one, we were just conflict, 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 never getting counseling, never getting help. Mm -hmm. And so things were just uh, intense. Um, I was a workaholic. Uh, I was very neglectful, not just of Tiffany, but of the kids and the family. You know, my priorities uh, back then are not what they are today. Back then, it was it was my job and me and, you know, whatever I'm doing. Uh, then God, then and, and sometimes God mm -hmm. would be up here, but then sometimes my, mm -hmm. my desires would, you know, mm -hmm. push him down. And then it would be my family and my wife and whatnot. Um, and they felt that. Um, even my kids felt that I remember uh, playing catch with my son, Josh, who was there that night, but he was like 11 or 12 at the time. And we're playing catch with the football. My cell phone rings. OK, we're talking. I don't know. It was in the evening. It was six, seven o'clock at night. It's still sunny outside. I should be off work, but my phone rings. I pick it up. I answer it. Now I'm playing catch with one hand. I'm catching it with one hand and I'm throwing it with one hand, the football and and after about two passes, he takes the ball, puts it on the ground, and walks away. Mm -hmm. And I told the person on the phone, excuse me, just one second. And I put them on hold, and it was a potential client. Um, and uh, I said, where are you going? He's like, you don't care to play catch with me. You just want to work. Mm -hmm. And so, which kills me to think that I did that to my son. Um, and I probably have apologized to him a million times after that. But... Um, but so it paints the landscape of what was going on during that time. Completely. Yeah. All the kids felt that. Where's dad? Yeah. It was probably working. Yeah. I get up from eating at dinner time and would take a call and Tiffany's left doing everything. And so yeah. I was neglecting the family um, emotionally, physically, because I wasn't there as much. Yeah. And then just her emotional tank was just being drained. Now, here's the crazy thing. This is why I didn't think things were all that bad. Sex was great. Hmm. Sex was great. Sex was frequent. Um, and I'm a guy. And yeah. I'm, you yeah. know, yeah. I'm a, you know, hey, if sex is good and frequent, it must not be that bad, you know. <laughs> right. And and the thing is, is that Tiffany was so chasing love and intimacy with me. She was using sex kind of as a tool to just get that connection with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Um but it blinded me to the reality of mm -hmm. the state of our marriage. So I tore her down through my words, through my actions uh, for a good 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And at that point, that's when that friendship formed with Lauren and Chad. And it just, yeah, and I just set everything up for this to happen. Yeah. In many people's books, this would be game over, showstopper. We're yeah. done. We're walking away from this thing. Right. How do you? How did you guys navigate those waters? Because I, 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 obviously, so much emotion, so much pain, mm -hmm. um, betrayal. Give us a snapshot on that. What it looked like to recover and where we're going. Just so everyone knows, is I think we. I want to talk about that, but ultimately, what we want to get to is, if we could rewind the tapes, if we could go back, what would you do differently? How can we learn from your guys's, uh, but you know this this story. Um, but, but I think it, we need to capture, like, how did you get to the place where you're at today? Cause that, for many couples that wouldn't happen. This, this would not be a reality. Mm -hmm. So are you asking, how did we get to the emotional state to say, let's work on our marriage? Yeah, I think it's that, or but it's also trust, right? I mean, like when this, this is that line that I think for most couples, it's such a betrayal at a heart level, mm -hmm. um, that many of them can't find the place to be able to trust again. And so the alternative is we need to go our separate way. So how did that trust, I think is ultimately what we're after, how did that be, um, become a reality for you? And then ultimately, how did you emotionally reconnect and heal, mend this relationship? Counseling. Okay. Uh -huh. Counseling. Um, 
we went to Pure Desire in Oregon with Dr. Ted and Diane Roberts, and they are amazing. And we would not be mm-hmm. here today mm-hmm. without them. Mm-hmm. And it was not a one and done type thing. We yeah. went to counseling for <laughs> a year and a half. And then I think after that, we had two tune ups. Yeah. We would just call them and say, we need a tune up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and regarding the entire trust thing, um, let's see. I think it was the second appointment that we went to. I went to the sheriff's mm-hmm. um, office and I took a polygraph. Wow. And um, I know that we tell some people that and they are like, you know, that's that's a little absurd. I mean, a polygraph. And the reason why it's so important is that Rick mm-hmm. told them the, some questions. I think it was five, five, questions, five yeah. questions that he really needed to know. And they asked, you know, about 20 and all. But when you take that polygraph test, it gives you a baseline. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you know, the truth you, and it gives you something to start from new. Yeah. And, and I think, and I've heard that that's such an important piece in this, um, when you're trying to rebuild trust, mm-hmm. it's like the layers get ripped off. I mean, you one yeah. step forward, two steps back, because things are revealed in the process that you keep digging. And I think what you're saying is this allowed for that baseline to be established right away, where yeah. as you journeyed through this recovery and counseling, it wasn't like more things were being revealed along the way Correct. that kept on setting you back. Is that essentially the power of the polygraph? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If I could speak to that for a yeah. second, the when Dr. Ted and Diane said, "Okay, we were going to ask Tiffany, are you willing to take a polygraph?" and she said, "Absolutely." Rick knows everything. That was like, "Wow, uh, okay," because mm. she's not special forces. Right. <laughs> she can't fake that. Yeah. She can't lie. She can't <laughs> beat the system. Yeah. She's not that. She's not deranged in that way. Mm-hmm. You know, to do something like that. So that was reassuring. Um, the questions that Tiffany mentioned that I was able to ask, Dr. Ted helped me uh, come up with five questions because some of the stuff, here's the thing. I don't want to know the morbid stuff, but I want to know the morbid stuff, but I don't, but I do. Yeah, and it, wow. it, 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 it's where your brain goes. It's like, but, but did they do this? What? And, and Dr. Ted would say, listen, um, some things you need to know, but some things knowing it's not going to help you at all. Mm -hmm. You, you know where the affair went, you know, that they had had sex. What more do you need to know? You know, you know, so I wanted to know stuff like, is it, is this the only guy, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that this has happened to, did you tell me absolutely everything Mm -hmm. so that I know everything, you know, there were certain questions that would serve as anchors for me. So Tiffany takes the polygraph, I go to the local mall, get a massage for this hour. I did. I was on one of those things in the center of the mall, just <laughs> just in total agony and, oh. and emotionally not knowing what I was going to find out. But Tiffany is right. It, it gave me a baseline. It got down to the bottom of the barrel, and it let me know exactly what I needed to forgive if I wanted to move forward. Mm-hmm. But here's the be- beautiful thing about it. Months later, because she passed, the the the... the Sheriff, the conductor guy said, um, uh, she passed with flying colors. He said, Rick, congratulations. You know, everything. Mm-hmm. I was like, great. I know what I'm forgiving. And then moving forward, whenever I'd have triggers, cause I'd have triggers, I'd have mm-hmm. triggers driving. I have triggers watching TV and I have triggers sitting in a business meeting and somebody would say something and my blood pressure would immediately rise thinking about my wife and what happened. And I would start, well, was there another guy? Could there have been another guy? I just don't, Oh, wait a minute. That was a question on the polygraph. Mm -hmm. She said, no, he said she passed. That's just my brain being my brain. I'm going to kick that to the curb. So it allowed me to, you know, uh, turn that trigger back off immediately. And my blood pressure would go down quick. So um, it was huge. That's good. That's good. One piece of this that I think many people are asking the question for kids, one of them there when this came out, Mm -hmm. But let's just for a moment, let's just talk about and it, what was so unique about your book is you actually have your kids write a chapter about their experience of this. And I think, you know, it's one thing in the moment when you're having the affair to not really think about the casualties. And, you know, obviously, this is going to affect my husband or my wife. Yeah. But there's the casualty, as, as you mentioned, Rick, 
not just the bot, you know, the church body that you were a part of, but it also mm-hmm. your kids, right? And so, tell me a little bit about that for them as they've journeyed through this. Uh, and maybe Tiff, and you can start with, um, you know, I think there was a chapter written by uh, your four children and their experience. There was. We finished the book without the chapter, and then I don't remember. I don't remember whose idea. It was um, but a friend of ours in Texas that's said, right, that's I would like right. to hear about the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had them write it and well, we asked them and they were happy to do so. Oh, yes. Yes. We, we <laughs> You're did. writing this. Yeah, no, it wasn't like that. Um, it was gut wrenching for me. Um, because when you're living in sin, it, you're just you're so selfish. And you're not thinking about all of the people that you're hurting. And as a mom, my first instinct is to protect my kids. I would do anything for them. Mm -hmm. But during that period of time, I just, um, yeah, I was just so selfish. And I didn't think about the damage and the hurt and everything that I was doing to them. So to read what they wrote, my goodness, it, mm. I probably had to read each chapter four times mm. before I could get through it without crying. It was so hard, but, um, but we're so glad that they did. And I think that it's been healing for them uh-huh. to read them and it's, it's helped us. I mean, it's, it's helped me just to, to know what they were thinking and then to provide the counseling so that they can heal from mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 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 It, it was a good chapter. It's proven to be one of the most powerful chapters in the book because I, I don't know that there is really a book out there where you hear from the children mm-hmm. what an affair from their parent uh how it affected them individually because it was different reactions. They all carried it differently. They all responded differently Mm -hmm. and they all healed differently. And so they talk about what it, how it made them feel. So um, you get the perspective from a child, how it makes them feel. You get the perspective from a child of what did that do to the dynamic of the relationship with their mom and then what it took for them to trust again. Yeah. And I think that if, especially if you're going through an affair or if and nobody knows about it, or it's just been exposed or you're flirting with it, it's emotional mm-hmm. and you're just heading down that path, especially if you have kids, um, read that chapter alone and, and see if you want your kids to experience that too, because it should stop you right in your track. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I got to ask this question. What made you guys fight for your marriage? Um, I, Rick forgave me. Mm-hmm. And that was so hard for me. And I know that that sounds, you know, weird or whatever, but it was really, I mean, he came to me 12 hours after he found out and he told me that he forgave me and I, that I just had so much shame. Um, but just hearing that he forgave me, I, that was all that I needed. Mm. I mean, that he would forgive me and that he still loved me. And that, and I, you know, I was like, all right, let's, let's do this. And mm. it was hard. It was really hard work, but so worth it. That's remarkable. I mean, I, I'm emotional over here. Like the fact that you can move that quickly into forgiving Rick, um, I got to ask, like, where did that come from? Well, um, you know, being people of faith and we have our relationship with the Lord, um, that night, um, I, I left the house and I was driving two hours South to go stay with my pastor. Cause I had called him. And even though I was a senior pastor, I still had a buddy of mine who I considered my pastor. And, um, and so I explained what was going on. I was like, do you want to just come over? We can talk. And, and so I said, yeah, so I left and, uh, on the way there, I called my friend, uh, my best friend, Dan in Southern California, woke him up, figure we're going to wake everybody up <laughs> and, uh, I needed to talk. And, um, and I, I just, I said something that I knew wasn't true. Um, uh, and I just said, 
I said, Dan, I go, dude, this is this is too big. I think this is even it feels like it's even too big for God to fix. And it was in that moment, you know, where a Christian would say, I heard the Lord. You know, it wasn't an audible voice or anything like that. But in the midst of my emotions and uh, just in this limbic state, uh, I was freaking out. I heard this thought that it was like this thought that just came penetrating in through my brain and it and it just kind of cut through everything. And it said, I can when I have willing hearts to work with. Hmm. And it was like, OK, I don't think I, I think this is too big for God to fix. But then I hear this thing. I can when I have willing hearts to work with. But then I responded just in my thought. I don't even know if I'm willing, you know, hmm. well, the next day driving around with my pastor and no context to the conversation of what was going on. I just, out of the blue, I blurted out, but she's still my wife. And, um, and then, but when I said that, it was like, wow, I recognize I still had love for her. Mm-hmm. That even this act of betrayal did not diminish or, or, or diminish isn't the right word, did not cancel out my love for her. Mm-hmm. And, um, I just, it was shocking to me. And so then I thought, well, maybe I am more willing than I realize. And then I felt like I heard the Lord again with that thought. And I felt like he said, you provide the heart. I'll provide the miracle. And, but then I thought, but I don't know if she's even regretful because that night it was a battle. It was, mm-hmm. it was not peaceful. She was like, well, maybe next time mm-hmm. you would Da, 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 da. I'm like, oh, okay, so if I don't do that, we're going to go have an affair. You know, I mean, yeah, it just it got right. chaotic. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. I didn't know where she was emotionally. And mm-hmm. within 10 minutes later, or within 10 minutes later, I get a text from her. After I hear you provide the heart, I'll provide the miracle. I get this text from Tiffany that said, I am so sorry. You did not deserve this. Our family did not deserve this. Nothing you have ever done warranted this type of behavior or action. And it was of true repentance. Mm-hmm. And it was in that moment of recognizing I still have a love for my wife, really feeling like the Lord challenging me and giving me a sense of hope. You provide the heart, I'll provide the miracle. Mm -hmm. I can do this if you give me your heart and she gives me her heart. I was like, I I gotta give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And, And as a believer, I've done worse to God. I've cheated on the Lord. I've betrayed God on multiple levels. Um, I've put other things before him in my life. And yet he is faithful to forgive and love and give me a chance after chance after chance. So it was really all of that happening very quickly um, Mm -hmm. within less than 24 hours Mm -hmm. when I came home. And when I saw her crying, she was just kind of curled up in a, you know, on a, on a chair in her living room with her knees up and her head down and, and uh, just the shame and the guilt it just broke my heart. And it's like, it's like the Lord just allowed me to see yeah. her, how he sees her. Yeah. Not how my flesh would want to see her. You did this to me. That that all just seemed to go away in that moment. And uh, and once I told her, I do forgive you, it, it just, it, it felt right. Yeah. It felt Jesus-like. And yeah. so off we went. Yeah. Know? Well, and I appreciate you sharing for that context or your guys' personal story because I think it's pretty yeah. relevant to what was going on. Um, let's talk about, I want to hear from both of you, kind of as you think about what transpired. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Let's start with you, Tiffany. I mean, obviously, I mean, the whole focus of this um, podcast, this video segment for our local chapters is around how do you fair-proof your marriage, right? Um, mm-hmm. How do you sa- put the safeguards on t- so that d- this doesn't happen? And for Tiffany, I think when you look back at what seemed to be innocent behavior, come mm-hmm. to find out wasn't so innocent, what would you what would you maybe say to the to the group of things that you could have avoided um, to not end up in that in that situation? Um, well, first of all, my uh, walk with the Lord was not good. It wasn't strong. I wasn't spending mm-hmm. time with Him each day, and um, so that right there is number one for me and key. Um, number two, anything that you do in private that you have to hide 
from your kids or your husband, you, it's not okay. You, everything you should be able to put up on a screen in your home, mm. you know? Um, so little flirty things that you're doing on Facebook and, um, you know, poking or comments or I think anything like that, um, you just, you can't, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, slippery slope. it's such a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. So don't, you know, don't even open that door. Don't, you know, um, and don't spend time. I think that you have to be, Rick was always very careful, especially being in ministry. Um, if he was counseling someone of the opposite sex, mm -hmm. uh, there was someone else in the room with him. You know, he, he didn't spend time with the opposite sex uh, without someone there. He, they didn't ride in a car, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I just think that you need to keep your guard up. Mm -hmm. all the time and that's something that i didn't do mm -hmm. you, you mentioned something early on in this um, conversation around i wish i had reached out at the time when i was in pain mm -hmm. how much of a factor do you think that would have played in this not snowballing in, in terms of where it went if you had if you had done that and I'm, I'm assuming that you're saying when you say reach out are you talking like girlfriend that you know reach out or like counselor reach out um, I can remember very early on sitting at a table with my mom mm -hmm. and I so wanted to, to tell her because she would have helped me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell her, you know, I think that at that point it was just emotional and, um, and I knew it was wrong, but I just had such guilt and shame that I was scared to tell her, which is ridiculous because <clears throat> she's, you know, she's my mom. Right. She loves me unconditionally. Hmm. And so if I would have told her, you know what? I could have even told Rick's mom. I'm, I'm close with her. Hmm. I could have hmm. told her that, hmm. that I needed help, that we needed help. Yeah. Um, but I didn't do it. Yeah. What happens if somebody didn't have those types of people? Because everybody is blessed like you are. Right. Would you say counseling? I would point? say counseling. Yeah. yeah. And if your spouse doesn't want to go with you, then go yourself. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. yeah. Rick, what do you think in terms of the guardrails, the yeah. affair proof <clears throat> aspect of this? What would you, what would be your thoughts? Um, well, much like Tiffany's, um, I'm a firm believer of affairs don't start in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. you know, they start with conversations, mm -hmm. Facebook folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, I think, you know, weighing the level or the depth of friendships you have of the op with the opposite sex in your marriage. You know, like, you know, I have friends that are, are female, but I don't have close, close friends that are females. So I would say convert close friends, friendships to casual friendships. It's not that you can't have a friendship with someone, but when it becomes close, meaning you've got your inside jokes, mm -hmm. you have, um, you confide in each other. Here's the thing. Here's our rule. She's the one I confide in. And if I'm not confiding in her, then it's another male friend that mm -hmm. I'm confiding in that's trustworthy. I won't confide in a female friend about an issue with my wife. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen it happen where it just, it converts and changes and people go, oh, that'll never happen to me. Well, I mean, I never thought this was going to happen to us either. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, casual friendships being converted or close friendships converted to casual friendships, um, uh, very, and everything Tiffany just said, really, you know, being mindful of the interaction that you have with the opposite sex mm -hmm. on social media. Um, I like what she said about, you know, not hiding anything, you yeah. know, just putting up these safeguards. Yeah. And, and I think those things that you're talking about are more of, um, they are the guardrails, right? right? In order to make sure that the exterior aspects of what we're dealing with don't come in on the relationship. Correct. Mm -hmm. Let's go internal to the relationship. What are the things that created that depletion in your relationship emotionally that if you could rewind the clock, this would have been just maybe one or two things that would have yeah. been a game changer for you guys to not be in that place where you're actually vulnerable looking 
especially for you, Tiffany, looking outside of the relationship for for that connection, that that sense of um, belonging and affirmation, validation. Um, well, I don't feel like we had the tools hmm. that we needed. Mm -hmm. um, we really, we did not communicate well. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? We didn't fight the right way either. And um, so there were those things that we that we really needed. Um, and one thing I we did not um, we didn't I don't feel like there was a lot of serving mm -mm. going on. And one thing that I really love that I um, heard is let your marriage be a serving contest. Try mm -hmm. and out serve the other person. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't know. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, I think that, well, one, I didn't know Tiffany's love languages. Oh, Didn't yeah. even know that she had love languages. That's so, wow. so important. And and hers are uh, acts of service, of course, gifts. Um, but uh, no, uh, what was it? Acts of service and, um, oh, no, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, <laughs> um, Words of affirmation or well, that's quality, me. Time, quality <laughs> time? No, no. I'm uh, acts of service and gifts. And gifts, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And quality time was kind of like a third one there for her. That's what it was, yeah. So what it was is that I wasn't meeting Tiffany's emotionally needs, which made her not feel valued, saved, and loved. Mm -hmm. See, she had a phenomenal relationship with her father. And her dad, he would lock the door and lock the house up and, you know, and, and check on the cars and keep the yard clean and stuff like that. I didn't grow up that way. None of that was even on my radar. I mean, we never locked the door at night. In fact, my dad left the key in the ignition of the truck that was out in the front yard. I, I mean, so to me, it was never modeled. So at night when she would say, are the windows shut? I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> and then she's like, why well, don't you want to shut them? I'm like, yeah, we're safe. We're fine. And it, but to her, that communicated what you don't care enough about me to make sure that we're locked up. Right. So when you're, when I don't do that and I'm dismissive and not making her needs a priority for me, that tore her down. Yeah. So if we're going to get, like you said, inside the marriage, Tiffany's right, out serving each other. There are things that she will ask for or desire and I'll go, that doesn't make sense to me. It's not a big deal. Time out. It's not a matter if it's, a, it doesn't matter if it's not a big deal to me. If it's a big deal to my wife, Instead of trying to convince her that it's not a big deal, why don't I just serve her and make it a big deal? Yeah, She might feel valued. She mm -hmm. might feel loved. She'll feel cared for. She'll feel protected. Mm -hmm. She'll feel guarded. But when you don't do that for 10, 15 plus years, I mean, it wrecks a person. Mm -hmm. And then you really believe you create this false narrative of the level or type of love that your mate has for you and that she was just depleted. So yeah. internally, those are the things I think we probably would have done better. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and unwritten rules. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, you he grew up in his house. I grew up in mine. Mm -hmm. And then we came together. But he had his unwritten rule. Is that what it is? Unwritten. Uh, unwritten, unspoken. Unspoken yeah. rules. And then we brought them together. But we never talked about what they were. Yeah. You know, and if we would have dug a little deeper and um, done a little bit of the hard work, then I would have known why certain things were important to him. And he would have known why things, certain things were important to me. But instead, we just kept hitting heads. And yeah. yeah. Those things that Tiffany's mentioning, like I'll give just one example, the okay. scouring of the sink. Okay, I cleaned up the kitchen one time, and she's like, "Did you scour the sink?" I'm like, "No." And she goes over there and starts scouring the sink. All mad. I'm like, "What are you? What are you upset? We well, didn't didn't do the full job. You got to scour the sink. You have to you have to scour the sink. <laughs> and, and, and I'm when like, you're done cleaning up the dinner dishes, <laughs> so that you can walk into the kitchen and it, you know, the angels are there. Yeah, right? yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. But see, I didn't grow up that way. But her dad, that was the rule. When you clean up the kitchen, you scour the sink. So it was a rule in her heart and in her mind. It was unspoken. Mm -hmm. So when I didn't do it, she thought I was just being lazy. Right. I, I, you know, and so instead of 
revealing that it's, hey, oh, okay, this is like a unspoken rule. It's a rule I have, an expectation. You're not meeting it. Right. And now I'm mad at you. Yeah. Time out. Maybe we should unpack where that comes from. Yeah. Right. So we That's had good. to learn to do that. That's good. So. Well, what I love about your guys' book um, is that not only were you extremely transparent, I mean, there's rarely people, and I've, and I've actually interviewed couples that have walked this journey, and they were pretty um, selective on what they put out there to the world, because this, this is a vulnerable place, right? Um, you guys were remarkable in that, but not only that, but I think also sharing, like, how do you repair from something like this? How do you safeguard and the practical aspect of it, and then also the more intentional pieces that need to go into it. And uh, so, man, if there's a book that you need to read as a married couple, it is mended. And I'll just put that out there right now. Like you need to read this book, not just from the story and how compelling it is. I mean, I think we all want to lean in and, 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 and see right. the trajectory of your guys' story. It's unique. It's special as the, as much as it's painful, it's special, but I think it's about what applications come out of it for, for couples. And that's really what we hope will be a part of this journey. Um, whether you're hearing this online or you're part of one of our local chapters and you're um, going through one of our meetups, going through the questions that we put together around this topic and around your guys's book. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for being on this uh, today on the video and the podcast, um, willing to share and uh, maybe just Final sign off from you all, something that you would share with a a couple who's struggling right now or has found themselves in this place where there is an affair um, and they are saying game over. This is a a showstopper. Um, Don't lose hope. Don't Mm. don't give up. Don't. um, It's really easy to, in the beginning, just... uh, you know, like sometimes when we were in counseling, I, I, you know, it was just such a mess that I would just get up and walk away. And, you know, like I had to come back and sit mm-hmm. down and um, take a deep breath and find someone to help you. It's so much easier if somebody else, you know, like comes in between Rick and I and takes both of our hands and walks with us and then pretty soon we're holding hands mm-hmm. and they're cheering us on it mm-hmm. it can be done yeah yeah i would say you fell in love with them before and before all this happened in the beginning of your relationship mm-hmm. you had that honeymoon oh i love this person feeling that can happen again mm-hmm. it is possible mm-hmm. it is going to take tough work It's going to take counseling, not just sweep it under the rug. It's going to take counseling. But if you put in the hard work and you put things in place to rebuild trust Mm -hmm. and you recreate um, uh, kind of like a covenant of how we're going to behave, you know, um, moving forward, um, you can find that person, that, that, that wife or that husband that you fell in love with again. And I can honestly say, I love Tiffany more today than we ever have. I mean, Mm -hmm. truly, we have the relationship that we have. We're still working on it. I mean, we had an argument earlier this week, Mm -hmm. but we have the tools Mm and how to navigate that so we don't go back to stupidity. We, Mm -hmm. we, We move forward. And so I would say it is possible to get back to where you connected and you fell in love, but it's gonna take tough work Mm-hmm. Uh, and time and time yeah it, it doesn't you can't happen overnight. rush it yeah you yeah. you know the yeah. trust you re- rebuilding trust that you know that that takes time doesn't I, happen rick, overnight no rick mm-hmm. had the password to you know first i was off facebook and all social media mm-hmm. and he was getting all my texts and on my phone uh, yeah and you know you have to you have to be vulnerable and you have to be willing to rebuild the trust and yeah. work through triggers also. And, and lastly, uh, and I know we need to wrap up, Noel. Um, lastly, I want to say this. If when we went to counseling, I was like, yeah, we're going to counseling. We're going to get her fixed mm. um, <laughs> because I'm not the one that did it. She did it. Time out. Nine times out of ten, it takes two people. There are those rare cases where you might be innocent, but that's very rare. Um, but the thing is, is that. Let's say you are that rare case where 
I really didn't do anything. Maybe my wife, uh, my spouse is a sex addict and has a porn addiction and this is really them. Mm -hmm. They need to go to counseling. No, you need to go to counseling too mm -hmm. because you've been hurt mm -hmm. and wounded. So you go to get healed. They go to get healed. Then you do couples counseling together so you can heal as a, mm -hmm. as a unit. Mm -hmm. And so instead of saying you go off and get fixed, right. You're only solving half the issue. Yeah, so yeah, that's our that's advice. Good. I'm sorry. It was a little bit that's longer. <laughs> well, we did run long on this, but it's so worth it because I think what you guys have shared is um, essential. Uh, so powerful. So thank you guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh, Amended is the book. You can find it on Amazon, but better than finding it on Amazon, you can find it at mendedbook.com. <laughs> mendedbook.com. Yes. Go there uh, and, and pick it up. But again, thanks, you guys. Appreciate you being on. All right. today. Thank you. Thanks, All Noel. Right. Uh -huh. Bye. -bye.